wants you and I to know you are not disqualified. God wants to empower you. He's looking for those that are able to take what they have, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and run towards someone. Are there any runners in the room? There is a generation in New Zealand. In a matter of fact, there is a church in New Zealand that says the only one that will get our worship is Jesus Christ, the hope of glory. Hey, welcome everybody. It is Global Impact Saturday. Before we start, how good was last night? Man, Global Impact opening night always delivers. Have you got any voice left after last night? What an incredible night. And uh, we would like you to start off the bat just writing some comments. Let's get the ball rolling this morning. Write what you most enjoyed about last night and then we'll launch into Saturday. I want to say thank you so much for all our online campus for joining us today. I want to say welcome if you're in the South Island watching via a watch party. I want to say a big hello to all our church family from across the globe. Pastor Jerry and Toby leading the charge in Canada. Um, Pastor Frank and Gladys up there in India. We want to say welcome. We want to say welcome to Pastor Fortune and Rosalind and all our campuses in Philippines joining us online today. A big malo lele to Tonga to Pastor Havili and Pastor Isaiah who are joining us. Hola to all our church family joining us in Mexico as well. You are so welcome and we know that we've got a great day in store for you today. So this morning we have Lord Bob. Lord Bob is an incredible man of God. He's been walking with God for a long time. It's no secret that he's a billionaire. So he knows what he's talking about today. But really, if you just left it there, you'd miss out because in his story, in his testimony, are some incredible moves of God. Number one, um, he has actually led a, 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 a team out of such a trial into such a victory uh, in the business arena. And also, he's gonna give you some great tips on how to flourish in amongst the current climate. So I would suggest that you buckle in right now, get your fingers ready to, uh, to say what impacts you the most. Uh, enjoy the day. Great to see you out here this morning. Uh, what a beautiful day it is out there. And uh, I have to give credence to a couple of the young youth pastors who actually had to sleep in the youth tent last night. Uh, I think Nick slept out there and I said, did Holly sleep out with them to keep him warm? But 
No, she didn't. So, you know, we need to have a bit of marriage counseling there. But uh, I thought the hologram was great last night. Hands up those who agree with me. Um, great technology for the world we live in right now. Uh, I always go home with regret. Who, know, who, who knows about regrets, you know? And uh, I always think, how could I have done it better? That's, that's the point I'm making. How could I have done it better? And my only regret was I should have got uh, the camera to pan the crowd and get him, and, and at the beginning, waving to Pastor Jürgen, and he would have responded and waved back. Because it wasn't until the end of the older call that probably 90% of people I've spoken to realized that he could see us, you know? And uh, obviously it was two ways. So he, the camera was right there. He could see the whole auditorium while he was preaching. And a lot of people didn't quite connect with that. And when I was talking with young people over at McDonald's last night, we had a couple of hundred young people over there. They ate their hearts out, let me tell you that. I have to confess, I did have an apple pie and an ice cream. But um, the thing is, is that most of them, when they found out it was two-way, they said, that is super cool, like it went to a whole nother level being two-way. And so I think I could have, um, you know, you always got to learn how to do things better. And uh, obviously, it's the first time you've ever done it, right? But I, uh, just by way of introduction, you may have uh, read, but I liked it uh, in the newspaper. You know, the guy who does Rocket Lab down in, in Napier, right? And uh, there's a great quote. He said, you don't get to go to Mars working from eight to five, Monday to Friday. You want to write that down. That's a great quote. A lot of people want to go to Mars, but they just want to work 8 till 5, Monday to Friday. Guess what? You don't get to go. And I thought that was a great quote. So in any case, that's worthwhile going. Let's just dismiss the meeting and go home. No, just kidding, just kidding. Uh, obviously, we would allowed to have Lord Bob here in person. He's a personal friend of mine. And unfortunately, due to COVID, I was uh, going on his... Uh, he's got a beautiful, you know, luxury boat, um, it's a whole nother world, this world that he lives in with private planes and, and luxury boats and so forth. And in any case, I've had a little bit of a taste. Hands up those who know when you have a taste, you want more. Okay, I'm just being honest with you today. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's like flying up the front of the plane. When you've been up the front, you do not want to go to the back again, right? But I've known what it's like to be up and back, up and back, but I know where I'd rather be. So in any case, enough to say that um, we would, I've been on his boat four times now around the world, different countries, and it's just a beautiful experience. And I was due to be up in Indonesia with him, Bev and I. And uh, of course, then COVID hit and that whole trip was cancelled. We're going around the islands up there. And so, you know, to be honest, I hate COVID. I hate it. I mean, you know, that experience is gone, come and gone. I never got the photo, never got to be there. So any case, I, I tell you right now, though, that Lord Bob is just such a wonderful guy. We have had the privilege of him being in the church. He's a real deal. He's a multi-billionaire. Uh, he's a guy who is generous. He's a guy who is just down to earth, practical. You can talk with him. You're going to see an interview with, uh, between Josh, our Josh Adams and him, and it's just a great interview. You're going to learn some things uh, this morning just because of his experience, and it's going to help us in the world that we live in right now. And uh, him and Lady Tracy, they're living in Australia right now. They built a big house in Ritchie Door. I've been there, right on the water there. It's, it's more than a house. It's, it's, it's massive. So in any case, enough to say um, he's just a lovely guy. And he's got a house in, um, in uh, London, beautiful property. And of course, also a house in uh, what's it? Portugal. So one of those kind of people. But as I said, he just loves people, loves the Lord and uh, just, just loves to be able to share his wisdom. So you're gonna be blessed this morning. And I have to say also, and I wanna say, Pastor Leon Fontaine, he's a CEO of a large television company. He's an actor and author and a senior pastor of the largest church in Canada. And uh, in his sessions, I tell you, every, not only for Christians, but business people particularly, you'll be so blessed to hear Pastor Leon Fontaine this afternoon. He's very, very good as well. So I'm blessed. I mean, you know, to be honest, I'd love to have these guys here in person. But as we know, the world we live in, it's not happening. But this is the next best thing. And I know you're going to be blessed by being here this morning. So thank you for coming out. Really appreciate that. Let me pray for you. And we're going to get right into it. All right? Cool. Father, we just want to thank you for today. We thank you so much for this business session. Thank you for every business person. I pray your blessing over them, Father. 
Pray that, Lord, You'd inspire them. And, and Lord, we thank You for Lord Bob and Lady Tracy, what they're doing in the earth and ministry, oh God. Just pray that You would, Lord, flow through them even as they speak to us, even be it via the screen. We pray, oh God, Lord, Your anointing to be upon His words. That, Father, everyone would leave with a takeaway. Every one of us would leave, Lord, with something to think about, something we can do to improve our situations, Father. And so, oh God, we pray Your blessing over it and we give You the praise and the glory in Jesus' Name. Amen. Would you put your hands together and welcome Lord Bob. I want to say hi to our friends, Pastor Peter and Bev Mortlock. Tracy and I send you a big hug. We miss you and wish we could be there with you. We're here in Australia, actually, but we're not allowed to travel to New Zealand. So near and yet so far. We also want to say to all of you at City Impact Church, have an amazing conference. We were with you a few years ago, and I had the privilege of sharing my testimony and a few business thoughts with you. I've been kindly invited to address you again, but as I have already shared my testimony, I was wondering what would be the most useful to you this year? Let's face it, this has been the most extraordinary 18 months a once in a generation global pandemic. The last one was 100 years ago in 1918. All the normal rules of the game have changed and many of them have changed permanently. The future is now more than ever uncharted territory. It has affected different countries with different degrees of severity, but no one has escaped being impacted in some way or another either to a greater or a lesser extent. Most of you would have faced a challenging business environment and some of you might not have made it. So how do we make sense of it all and how should we respond? Firstly, let's remember that God is still on the throne. He's still in control. He hasn't been taken by surprise because he knows the future. Secondly, Remember that we are first and foremost Christians, which means we already possess life's greatest prize, Jesus. Whatever we may have lost pales into insignificance to what we have in Him. Thirdly, I believe it is now more important than ever to stay in close touch with God. Psalms 25 verse 14 says, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. I'm a person who likes to be in control. The last year has been a steep learning curve for me. Every plan I've put in place has had to change, not once, but multiple times. I've had to learn again and in a more specific and detailed way than ever before that God is in control and that all my plans need to be directed by Him. The verse in the Bible that has become very real to us is Proverbs 16, 9, where it says, we can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. I cannot tell you the number of times our plans have been thwarted, only to find out that God's plan was better. His plans sidestepped every major problem we would have encountered if we had followed my plans. This has brought us to a place where we now turn to God more often, even in the little things. I don't know if you're like me, but I've had the habit of only going to God and consulting Him on the big decisions of life. It was almost as if I thought, he was too busy and I didn't want to bother him with all the little stuff. Well, a lot of little stuff, if it's undealt with, accumulates and eventually becomes big stuff. When you consider that he is the creator of the universe, his power, there is no difference to him between a big problem and a small problem. They're all small problems as far as God is concerned. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, 6, in all your ways acknowledge him, and He will direct your path. Again, along this line, I've been very challenged by the subject of faith. Romans 12, 3 says, we should not think of ourselves more highly than we ought, but to think soberly according to God has dealt 
to each man a measure of faith. So it's not just about how smart or intelligent or successful or wealthy that you are, but it's according to the measure of faith you've been given. So my prayer to God has been, give me more faith. I want to understand what it is to have complete trust and faith in him in every circumstance and situation. In all my ways, not just the big stuff. I read this verse in John 14, 13. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I'll do it. I found myself saying to God, are you serious? Do you really mean that? It's incredible. Well, God, your word said it, and I absolutely believe your word is true. I'd absolutely believe that you keep your word, so I'm gonna start asking. I'm gonna start asking in the little things. Let me give you a small example. In March 2020, we wanted to come to Australia and see the house that we were building. But we were rejected, even after making a special appeal. In the event, the house wouldn't have been ready and we would have spent a very frustrating time there trying to resolve all the issues. In September 2020, having come to terms with God orchestrating our plans, we decided to apply again. The same application to the same people, but this time we were accepted. A miracle as far as I'm concerned, with so low number of people being accepted, his timing often feels late, but he makes everything perfect in his time. I was worried about two weeks in a hotel quarantine and being unable to work uh, during that time. But by chance, we found out the name of the hotel that we'd be staying in close to Maroochydore Airport as we were flying in by a private plane. I decided to call them, but they said they didn't deal with the accommodation, the police did. And there was a police officer there, and if we'd like to talk to them, uh, we could. We did, and we cut a, to cut a long story short, the hotel wasn't in the main city, so it wasn't full when we were due. So we were able to get an additional room with a small kitchen and have our computers set up ahead of time by our staff. And they even managed to move an exercise bike in uh, from our home there. So we were truly blessed. Two days after we left, they closed that particular hotel for COVID quarantine and sent all newcomers to Brisbane, which is where we would have had to have gone. God is interested even in the little things. 2020 was a year when we could do a lot of jobs we'd been putting off. I got to read a few books to sort out 30,000 photos get fitter, lose a little bit of weight. I also finished my first and only book that I'd started writing some 10 years previous. I've spent a lot of time watching, watching good Christian content on YouTube and caught up on a lot of the global news regarding Brexit, the EU, the American election, China, Russia, and the Middle East. I believe you can't make good decisions without good information. So it's important that you stay well informed. The problem is, you can sometimes get a little depressed with too much information, so you have to be careful. In particular, as someone who is fascinated by end times issues, it's important to gain a good balance. I've lived through the time when Israel was, had the Six Day War, and then, then the 1973 Yom Kippur War. These events, these events take on a great significance as a Christian. I settled a long time ago how I would deal with this from a business perspective. Luke 19, 13 says, and he called his 10 servants and delivered them 10 pounds and said unto them, occupy till I come. Occupy to me means keep busy, take ground. Some other translators say, do business till I come. So that is what I do. I don't shut up shop and head for the hills. 
In 2020, with COVID, it was hard to see how some parts, if not all, of my business was going to make it. Whilst I've mentioned we need to trust God and pray, you must be prepared for the fact that the answer may be no. My prayers to God are not conditional. I'm going to love Him and serve Him to the best of my ability, whatever my circumstance. I also never bribe God by saying, if you'll do this for me, I'll do that for you. When car sales in April fell by 97%, I knew we had a serious problem. This meant we had to lay off people, we had to cut our cost, and it didn't look like we were going to be in a position to make our usual gift to our Christian charity. I discussed this with my son Andrew, who's running the business on a day-to-day -day basis, and we agreed that we were not going to allow the enemy to get the better of us. And instead of our normal donation, donation which was around 15 to 30 percent of our annual profit, we would give 100 percent for 2020. We didn't tell the management as we were laying people off and cutting back bonus payments and salary increases, and I knew that that would have been a problem. We expected profits to have been around 15 million or 15 percent of what we were budgeting for the year. Well, in the events, profit turned out to be 48 million, which was way outside our expectation. Two days after we made the first tranche of our donation, we completed on two deals which we'd been working on. One was the sale of a retail shopping centre for £6 million more than we had valued it at. The second was the largest ever, ever single development and letting of a building in the country. It was 238 acres site with 2.94 million square feet of buildings, equivalent to 40 soccer pitches. We led it to Jaguar Land Rover and pre-sold it to a large pension fund for a total profit of 74 million pounds, which we'll earn over the next two years. Whilst it had been difficult to tell my non-Christian directors of our decision to give away all our profits, especially as we had to keep our banks on board and keep them happy during this time, I'm sure they couldn't have helped but notice the timing of these two deals, how they came to fruition two days after uh, we made the donation. At this point in my life, I don't need the money, but it's wonderful to have the resource to keep blessing our Christian endeavors. It's also fantastic for it to be a witness to my directors and staff and other business people. Knowledge is power. God knows everything and he is all powerful. I was once invited on the mega yacht of a, a billionaire, Joe Lewis. He's the owner of Tottenham Hotspurs Football Club in the UK. He trades all sorts of stocks and shares and currencies. I asked him for some tips and he told me he doesn't give tips, but he was willing to tell me what he was investing in. You see, the problem with giving advice is that it doesn't work. if it doesn't work out, you get blamed. If it does work out, they regard themselves as being so clever. So it's a no-win situation. So please don't take anything I'm going to say as advice. Rather, it's my thoughts on the present situation. Every, everyone is asking the question, how are things going to change in the future? It's a good question, but probably, more importantly, as Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon said, the, the most important question is, what's going to stay the same? His answer to that question, people are never going to want things delivered slower and at higher prices. So he set out to solve that problem, deliver quicker and cheaper. And he's done the most incredible job. So perhaps that's the question we should be asking ourselves in addition to what's going to change. I believe the present crisis offers huge opportunities. I have often said to my people, never waste a good recession. And I've been through a few. Recessions allow us to cut away unnecessary costs that have accumulated during times of plenty. They also throw up some great opportunities. Most changes can usually be seen seven or eight years beforehand, and sometimes 
The problem is we're so committed to our present way of operating that we don't uh, adapt. Kodak is an example in point. They invented the first digital camera, but they were committed to the film model, and they eventually went bankrupt. Change is here to stay. So what are the opportunities that may arise specifically as a result of COVID? Globalization will decline. Governments will increasingly look to source strategic supplies in country. For instance, the F-35 jet fighter, fifth generation fighter is made partly in Turkey. And America has decided it won't sell the fighter to Turkey. So a strategic weakness has been uncovered. Medical supplies and vaccines are increasingly going to have to be made in country. And critical supply chain products will have to be uh, sourced in country. Demand for office space will reduce as people get used to working from home. People moving out of city centres, particularly apartments, and, and buying houses on the outskirts. Retail shops will decline with increasing home deliveries. Whole shopping malls may have to close. How can they be repurposed? Good question. Is there an opportunity here for the church? Retail will have to be repurposed towards residential and entertainment as shops close. On the other hand, distribution warehouses will be in demand. There's going to be a move away from manufacturing in China to other third world countries and domestic manufacturing. I believe this will result in a level of inflation for two reasons. So many companies will have closed in the supply chain countries that inevitably prices will go up. We're seeing early signs of this with the building materials in the UK. And I think also in Australia, I'm hearing the same too. Governments have printed so much money, this usually leads to inflation, which usually leads to higher interest rates. However, this is a two-edged sword as it increases the cost of funding government debt. So they'll try to hold inflation down. But will they be successful? I have my doubts. There will be opportunities, though, to acquire good businesses that have been brought down due to COVID. If we can just see the future trends and get in on them, to take historic businesses that have worked well, but take them online instead of high street shops with all the overhead. Looking at some things that are gonna stay the same, people will always need somewhere to live. Although residential demand will adapt, it's always gonna be there. There's gonna be some things you can't do online, like visit the dentist. So you consider those areas for, for stable property investment. Anything related to building, materials, design, construction, etc. There must be many areas which you would all know yourself in your own market that will not change and those will be opportunities too. The reason I chose the three areas of business that I'm in is as follows. Cars, I never wanted to manufacture things because you can always be in cut, undercut by others in low cost markets uh, and they can bring something in cheaper. I wanted someone else to have the hassle of investing and developing the products and I just wanted to be the middleman. I also wanted high value, high volume products and cars fit that perfectly. With regards to property, which is another area of my investment, as Mark Twain said, they're not making any more land. Property is a level playing field, as you can't be beaten by cheap imports. No one imports buildings. They have to be built locally with the same terms and conditions. So you're pitting your wits against domestic competitors. And then finally, finance. If you have a business, which lends money in your country, well, the money's the same, whoever it comes from. It's just a question of the algorithms you use. So there is no cheap imports of New Zealand dollars. Therefore, again, it's a level playing field. The biggest problem is the rate that you pay for it and who you lend it to. 
It's a tough business and you have to have deep pockets. It's also subject to a lot of regulation. With most businesses, you know if you've made a profit when you've sold your product or you've done a deal. However, with finance, you don't know until the customer has paid off his loan, as often people default. Lastly, I want to say I treat my charity in the same way as I treat my business. I protect it when things are hard, but I look for opportunities. In 2020, no one could travel, so we had unused travel budget. We had an unused conference budget. So I didn't want that to just hold us back. And I reused the surplus budget to spend more money on direct marketing campaigns, introducing people to Jesus. The result was instead of 2 million introductions to Jesus in the month of February, we're now running in excess of 30 million a month. That's a million a day. I'm going to answer some questions shortly, but I want you to take this away from what I've said. Number one, pray and seek God's guidance, even in the little things. Come to him in faith and involve God in everything. Look for the opportunities amidst all the confusion. And when you succeed, continue to honour God. I want to say well, that was amazing, Lord Bob. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to, to speak with us. And it's great to hear from someone uh, who has true experience on a, on a global scale. Uh, your story and your continued work is uh, truly an inspiration and both an example of, of faith and action working together. Um, so I want to thank you for sharing in practical terms um, what this recent challenging time looked like, uh, but also reminding us to focus on the opportunities that are ahead of us. It can be so easy to bog ourselves down. So with that in mind, um, I know you've seen, and you mentioned in your, in your talk, you've seen a number of market cycles that some of us haven't even experienced yet. Um, and so I wanted to take you right back to the start of, of IM Group, if I could, and I know it's part of your, your testimony, because uh, I think there's, there's some parallels with, with your, the birth of that organisation uh, and where people and some businesses find themselves today. So it's 1970 five or six, something like that, and uh, is it Jensen Motors has just gone into receivership, and then within 12 or 18 months, uh, you have secured the, uh, the franchise, was it for Subaru in the UK, and um, was that a case of having some of the structure and things in play already, um, and carrying the right ingredients, or was it just being in the right place at the right time? Well, um, at that time, we had the three-day week of the oil crisis, uh, so we were only getting rationed two gallons of fuel at the pump. And businesses were only allowed to run three days a week because they didn't have enough power generation. So it was a really difficult time. Getting a job at a time like that would have been tough. And I joined Jensen, and Jensen was making seven-litre cars. And, you know, two, two gallons of fuel just about got you home and you had to go back and fill up the pumps again. So it was really a bad time. And, you know, God has a, a wonderful way of turning a crisis into opportunity. If you take Joseph, he was in prison and God made that prison his opportunity. And so often we have it that God sort of promises something and it seems like there's the promise, first of all, then there's a total reversal of that. It seems like it's impossible. And then there's a restoration of it. And that seems to have been what happened in my life there. So the crisis, as an accountant, I was uh, the, the finance director eventually of Jensen Motors. My career had just dived off a cliff um, and there was no future, but uh, I got the opportunity to start the parts business. And from there, um, I, I managed to get the Subaru franchise. I do regard that as probably my greatest achievement. Uh, reason being, um, 1,200 people had been made redundant uh, during this period, and I only saved about 69 jobs uh, in the parts business. They'd all seen their friends go, and it was a heavily trade unionized business, um, and I had to try and lift their morale to the point where we had an ongoing business and actually a parts business for a car that's no longer made isn't an ongoing business. But 
within a year, we'd managed to land the Subaru franchise. Now, I believe, obviously, God had a hand in it because there were 10 applications for it. And uh, they said to me years later, there was something about the atmosphere in the business that we really liked. And we also knew that you needed us. So um, sometimes crisis can be the launching pad for great opportunity. They say, if you want a good opportunity, find a big problem. If you want a big opportunity, find a big problem. So uh, we certainly had a big problem and uh, we got a great opportunity out of it. That, that, that's amazing, what an awesome testimony. And uh, I love how you effectively took something that was in your hand, which might have been what was left out of the, the staff from that organization, and then we're, we're able to repurpose that. And I think so often we, we look outside for opportunities, but how often God is saying, what is in your hand right now and how can that be repurposed? So uh, I just wanted you to just maybe speak for a moment about how you, how you look within and, and you know, find that opportunity to take what's in your hand and give it new life again. I'm reminded of the story of the five loaves and two fishes. What did they have? They just had five loaves and two fishes. Um, and that's what they fed the people with. And uh, I think God is uh, able to just take what we have. Um, and I, uh, there's in the scripture, very, very often people have had to do things with what's in their hand. Like Gideon, he had bought some pitchers and, and he didn't have hardly any uh, so, uh, soldiers, just 300 against a huge multitude. But what was in his hand actually won the day. And uh, David had a, a single stone. Uh, well, he had five stones actually. Uh, and he used what was in his hand and what his skills and capability were. Um, I think when you start a business, you should ask yourself that question. It's very rare for somebody to start a business out of uh, a knowledge base of zero. Uh, if, you, if you don't know anything about the subject you're gonna go into, uh, you're going to have a big surprise when you get into it. I, I've found out that you rarely know everything about a business until you're actually in it. When I bought my property business, I thought property was all about location, location, location. Everyone will tell you that. I've since discovered, having now owned one for a number of years, it's about timing first, because even if you buy a good property, in a bad market, the good one's still gonna go down, even if it's in a good location. Uh, and uh, a bad one in a good time will still go up. So uh, it's timing number one. And the second one is how you finance it. And finally, it's location, location, location. So um, I think you should start with some knowledge base um, and work on that. Right. So it, so it sounds like you've identified problems throughout your career and then you've actually ended up creating businesses and uh, revenue streams around solving those problems um, throughout the course of time. So do you think that within all sectors of, of business that there is the opportunity for us to you know, expand on, on our revenue streams and, and find those opportunities? I think it's possible. Um, I, I think you need to think very carefully about it because you may not always understand what are the real drivers in that business. I'll give you an example. My finance company, um, well, the other companies, the car company, when I sell a car, I've made a profit. Uh, when I buy or sell a property, I, I've made a transaction, it's complete, I made a profit. With a finance company, I found it completely different because uh, when I made a loan, we paid commissions to the introducer of the loan, et cetera, et cetera and uh, we registered a profit, only to find that when uh, we had the global crisis, uh, we were taking bad debts of two million a month. And so all of a sudden, what had written, was written up as a profit was actually a, a latent loss, and it came through later on. So I think you need to understand the drivers of the business, and that was a very um, difficult lesson for me, uh, and uh, it's taken quite a number of years to start getting back what I lost in that tough time. So uh, I had misunderstood the nature of the business. So I think a, a lot of thought needs to go into what can go wrong. I, I always ask the what if question. What if this happens or that happens? What's my safety net? 
And of course, in that case, I had other companies and uh, whilst uh, and I had isolated that company so that it, it couldn't bring down the rest, all my companies I keep in separate sort of silos so that one doesn't destroy the lot. But understanding the business you're getting into is really important. Oh, it's awesome to hear and, and interesting to hear about how you, you silo it out like that. One, obviously, to protect itself, but, but just hearing your own experience that you felt inexperienced in that area and that, of course, had, had its own consequences. So obviously a huge part of what you do is surrounding yourself with the right people. And I've listened to your testimony and, and really admired how you've managed to uh, keep the generations uh, interested in, in your business. Now, a lot of us, we need good people around us, obviously, um, but the opportunity to have uh, family in the business and work with family is, it, it comes with its own challenges sometimes. And I wondered if you could speak to how you manage to keep uh, personal family situations out of the boardroom and, and you know, continue to empower that next generation. Well, I only have one son and two daughters, but I also have 10 grandchildren and four, at least I think four, great-grandchildren because one's due to be born today. Um, uh, so uh, I, I think by now I might have four. Um, the problem of passing it on from one generation to another is really quite difficult. In, in the first case, I only had the one son and he, he wanted to be in the business. The girls are doing different things. Um, so it was easy for me to pass it on to him. But now we're looking at, because he's now 51. Um, right. And so now we're looking at the next generation and there we're taking a lot of advice as to how to do it. We want it to stay as a family business. And we want it to continue blessing the kingdom long after I'm gone. But one thing you learn, you can't rule from the grave. So uh, I can't really put enough protections in place. I have to rely on my son carrying the same vision. And equally, I need to be uh, fair to my daughters. So how do I balance that out? Uh, I do think there's po probable issues in the future of, of sibling rivalry, sibling problems, and going on down. So I'm trying my best to actually involve mainly my son's family uh, in this, and uh, we're getting some outside advice from experts. Right. For instance, uh, I don't know if you know that BMW is owned substantially by the Quant family, but there's probably about 50 or 60 of them, and so you end up with a committee of the family, and you've got to separate the family and the management, because if it is that the only way you can succeed is by having being a member of the family, you won't attract yeah. the best talent, talent into the business. So we need the best talent, and it's good to have family members in there, but at the end of the day, if they feel there's a ceiling on where they can achieve because they're not, they've not got my name or want part of the family, that's a problem, and that's a very difficult balancing act. And um, so uh, I think uh, it, it's complicated. Uh, and sometimes uh, businesses can't last for generations in the family. There aren't very many 200-year-old family businesses still run by the family. No, but it's obviously been quite strategic for you because it, you know, it's since 76, well, it's longer than I've been alive, so you've, you've been in business a fair while. Um, and, and it must have been quite strategic to make the decision about you know, how do we continue involving family and, and how do we pass that on um, and like you mentioned, getting outside assistance that's impartial in that process is obviously quite important. I know we've got a lot of uh, businesses even represented uh, within this church that have generations of family involved, so it's great to hear. I had sort of broken the questions up, uh, Lord Bob, into uh, the early days and then your successes, and we've talked a bit about the successes and, and the generations and where things are at uh, now, I guess, but, but obviously a lot of your focus has moved into uh, turning that success into significance and influence within the, the global community and reaching people for Jesus. So, you know, as a, as a Christian businessman, obviously you had a really good grasp early on of what it, what it meant to be a good steward. You know, that it's, it's not ours, we're here to, to sort of farm it and, uh, and to grow it. And do you think that all of us have that responsibility, you know, both personally and in business to be good stewards of what's in our hand? 
I, I, think, I think that answer to that question is an unequivocal yes, we do. Uh, Jesus didn't just make commandments for one or two people, he made them for all of us. And so if it applies to me, it applies to you and it applies to everybody. We are all stewards of whatever we have, however little or however much. Uh, it doesn't really matter. And God isn't interested in the quantum. After all, he made the whole world and he could manage everything quite without us. I often tell the story of the, the, the widow and she gave just a, a, a penny or something uh, and the rich man was boasting about how much he gave. Um, but Jesus looked at it and said, she gave more because God measures it by what you got left. And I always say people can give much more than I can because I always seem to have more left. No, that's a, you, you, talk, you talk about that in your testimony. Um, you, you say that you wouldn't, you know, it doesn't matter what happens to the last million pounds that you earn, it's, it's about changing the condition of, of the human heart, which is what your focus is turned to. And I think that's, that's, that's incredible. So being a, being a successful entrepreneur, you've set up many charities, but what I get um, so inspired by is how does someone like you keep yourself envisioned with, with fresh ideas as you go through all these changes and these you know, new businesses and new charity, how, how do you keep going and keep getting inspired? I'll come back to the stewardship point, which is your first question. And uh, yeah, we all have to be good stewards. And you know, God is a creator and he made us in, image, in his image and likeness. So we are creators. I recently read something that said that your creativity doesn't diminish with age. Your physical capability may, but your creativity won't. And I think we always have to keep our brains alive and active. And as entrepreneurs, we're always looking for opportunities. I look at something and say, well, why are they doing that? Why don't we do that? Or maybe we could adapt that a little bit. And, and you've got that kind of inquiring, inquisitive mind, which is natural for an entrepreneur. Um, and. So I think uh, we've got to keep active and we've got to adapt. And the ministry we're in has adapted massively. Um, uh, when I first grew up, we were selling t uh, telegrams to people uh, and, uh, you know, I had to go on the telegram machine and send little single line texts. Uh, now, of course, you've got the internet, and you've got social media, you've got all sorts of me. We've had to adapt. Um, I have to agree that uh, I still find some of these new technologies a bit hard to get my mind around, but I understand the need for it. Uh, yeah, I understand the need for it, and I understand also that there are people who can help me with that. Absolutely, I think that's just such an, an awesome thought to kind of end on is that, you know, our creative um, gift from God just doesn't diminish as we get older. It really kind of, it's expanding. And so it's super inspiring to hear that, you know, as you're, you've got fresh ideas that you're, you're putting them into play and that that entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit uh, is, is alive and well. So I want to thank you immensely for, for talking to us today and for making the time to, to answer some of these questions that I know will be really valuable um, for our people to hear. And I'd encourage anyone to jump on and hear your testimony. Um, it, it's an amazing story from you know those found, founding years in, in the 70s to, to where you are today. So I really want to thank you for your time. Thanks, Josh. Good to talk to you. Well, you've got to admit, that's first of all coming out on a cool morning for, wasn't it? And uh, so much there. And you can just tell how genuine he is. He's just such a wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, such a gracious man, such a, a blessed man. And him and his dear wife, Tracy, as I said, they're just uh, such wonderful friends of ours. And we're honoured to have them as friends and honoured to have them even today. Just Hey, wasn't that such a great session? Thank you so much for joining us for Global 2021. Absolutely. We're Josh and Liv, and we're the online campus pastors. What does that mean? Well, City Impact Church has an online campus. And every Sunday morning at 10 a.m., we stream our service online, and we're building a whole uh, online church community. It's really, really cool. If you'd like to stay connected with us, then you can click the link that's coming up in the chat right now. You can check us out online. You can follow us on Facebook, and we've got a whole Facebook group that we're starting. But yeah, I mean, we'd love to stay connected with you. But thanks for being a part of Global Impact 2021. 
wants you and I to know you are not disqualified. God wants to empower you. He's looking for those that are able to take what they have, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and run towards someone. Are there any wonders in the room? There is a generation in New Zealand. In the matter of fact, there is a church in New Zealand that 